Hi, Vikash. Thank you very much for joining us online. I'm sure you're very, very busy um, here in Germany, not least at NABO Germany. We're very, very concerned to hear about what's happening in Mauritius, to see this oil catastrophe and this biological hotspot that you've got Mauritius spoiled by, by um, crude oil. Um, I understand you've just been to the Ilso de Oigret, the key site where this accident happened. Tell us what the what the situation is like now. Well, thank you very much for for this uh, conversation that we are having, uh, which is great and it's heartwarming for us to know that in Germany, NABU, the bird life partner uh, in Germany, we are the bird life partner in Mauritius, the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation, and that we are connecting. And I do meet NABU. Uh, staff at various conferences, when I, especially bird life conferences, and so it's great to see this friendship going beyond just conferences, but also when we are facing trouble. Um, the situation on uh, Ilo Zigret has uh, has improved significantly from the 6th of August, uh, two weeks ago, when uh, there was this oil spill. Uh, just uh, to put it in context. Nearly a thousand tons of uh, petroleum products spilled into the sea, and where the shipwreck was or is, uh, that is within two kilometers of the island called Ilo Zigret, and was in the directions of the winds and the current. So uh, the first site we could say that was affected by the oil spill was Ilo Zigret, which is a small island. It's 26 hectares. We've been managing it uh, since, we've been restoring and managing it since 1984. So 36 years that we've been involved, in fact, more than that. Um, and um, so just to see this beautiful island being surrounded by black coat of petroleum, and it, it even reached our shores, and the air was unbreathable because there was so much petroleum vapor in the air. Um, but today things have have improved significantly mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's been two weeks uh, since we had the exactly two weeks since we had the spillover. Uh, but also the uh, our national coast guard, our army, ourselves, because we were involved with the coast guard and the army in trying to pump up the oil, and we are still to this day. Uh, there's much less oil that is around Ilo Zigret. Uh, the sea uh, it still has a sheen, which is natural, which is uh, which what happens when you have uh, an oil spill, mm. because it's due to a very thin coat of oil, which is on the surface water. So the, the sea hasn't, hasn't yet uh, restored itself to get the natural sheen, that, the natural colors, the vivid colors that we are used to. And there's less Odor, there's less odor of petroleum in the air. It's still there, but still it is reduced considerably because the, pr the oil products have been pumped out and also uh, there's evaporation of the vapors which has already taken place. But there, there are also what, have, what we understand is that there's bacteria in the sea that will come and start eating uh, the, uh, the oil on the, on, the, on, the, on the surface. Plus the oil is also breaking up as well with winds and so on. So it's a significant improvement from uh, many weeks, uh, well, two weeks ago. Uh, however, that's not to say that uh, the island has not been affected uh, because the, sh the shores of the island has got uh, this, this black uh, oil, coat of oil. So Ilo Zigret is, is a coralline island. It's an old coral reef. And it with undercut from the from the currents and from, from the from the waves, it takes the shape of a mushroom, just mushroom shaped, and there is uh, there is oil product that's stuck on underneath. the perimeters okay. underneath the island, all around it, and in some case in some places, uh, the vegetation which was hanging over the island has been uh, has been oiled. And we've seen today that there was even places where the grass, the native grass, which was overhanging, uh, has dried out, has died. Wow. Okay. So, um, 
so the, the, we are, our staff are still working on the ground, although they don't spend the amount of time they were working because of a health and safety reason, mm. because uh, the, the, these, are, these are petroleum products, and uh, with petroleum products, there are health hazards and health risks. Of course. So we've drastically reduced the amount of time that our staff are on the island, um, and uh, the, they, we've also reduced their days, so they do one day out of two instead of being there all the time. And just to, just to note that our staff actually work and live on the island. Mm. So we've had to evacuate our staff because it was unbreathable. The air was unbreathable. Uh, for long periods of time, of course, we started getting migraines and uh, scratching eyes, red eyes, dry skin, um, dry lips, uh, and of course, the potential of getting worse things happens when yes. you're uh, inhaling the, this these toxic fumes. So, um, so I was there with uh, an expert from the shipping industry, uh, looking at the damage, showing him phys uh, physically what the damage was. Um, but our fear is that uh, the petroleum product may have uh, infiltrated into the uh, groundwater and uh, accumulating in the soil on the island. Uh, so there is humus, so that the the, soil, the the substrate on the island is thin, and it's uh, mainly sand and humus because of the coralline formation of the island. So it's not it's not a volcanic formation; it's a coralline formation. Um, and we are also concerned because uh, do these petroleum products accumulate in the plants and would that be a problem to our birds that feed on uh, nectar and pollen yeah. and to our reptiles as well that do the same thing mm. so we are uh, going to be looking at whether our plants are dying uh, on the island because of exposure to petroleum products we are going to look at uh, accumulation of petroleum products in uh, in the uh, in the plants themselves we are going to work with other scientists in toxicology to look at accumulation in the plants. So there's a team that's coming from uh, England, from Britain. There's also a team that's from Japan of experts in the area, in, in, that, in, that, um, in those subjects, which we are going to be discussing with. Um, and, uh, and of course, we are going to monitor the birds and the reptiles and the plants. Um, and the invertebrates as well, to look at the different levels of accumulation in these different forms um, and uh, trying to understand whether it's affecting survival of animals, whether it's affecting plant survival, and uh, whether it's going to affect breeding of animals. Mm. Uh, and a lot of these effects will not be known um, immediately. And these are effects... Yeah. That, that we can we can find out in the the months or years to come. Mm. You've got a tremendous job ahead. Yeah, you've been describing some of the effects on land. Have you also um, already got a um, an overview of what's happening underwater? So you've got some of the most pristine coral reefs. You've got mangrove forests. You've got seagrass meadows, which are you know, one of a kind in the Indian Ocean and beyond. Um, can you, at this stage, already assess the impact? Right now, no. Right now, no, because uh, for a simple reason that it's, uh, there are a number of reasons for that. First of all, it's only been two weeks since we had uh, this disaster. So those effects may not kick in until some more time. We have had, for example, we have had one green heron, which is a local breeding native bird, uh, which was found oiled. Uh, we have yesterday had a, a, a hawksbill turtle that mm. was found dead, most presumably killed by, by ingesting the petroleum. Um, and, and also there, there have been a few fishes that have been uh, turning up uh, deaths of fishes. Um, certainly, as I was mentioning that the uh, the sea is not the vivid green and blues that we are mm. used to, uh, and we fear that there might be deposition of petroleum onto the coral reefs. So there's a lot of coral that was growing, regenerating in the area, 
and uh, for the past 20 years. And now we fear that there might be effects on corals. Mm. However, what's happening is that a lot of different groups, different organizations are doing monitoring. Um, and the UN uh, is one of the organizations that's, and as well as uh, an organization called CFAS, which comes from Britain, they are trying to advise us on how to have a, an integrated, a coordinated uh, monitoring strategy. Mm -hmm. So that there are no overlaps, there are, there's no doubling up, and that uh, we don't forget to measure something which is important uh, because we think somebody else is doing this. So the monitoring systems will be put in place. Uh, we need a bit of advice and coordination on that one, and then we'll be able to monitor, monitor it. Uh, that said, I must also add that there are areas which uh, are still being cleaned, some of the local beaches, um, there are some beaches that are getting tar balls uh, accumulating. There are mangrove areas which are still have got the oil products, uh, oil that's accumulated in the mangrove areas. There's a company which has been involved, a French company, which has been brought in by the, um, by the insurance. And this company has, from what we understand, dealt with many oil uh, spills around the world. Um, and they've been brought in to literally take over the cleaning uh, with fishermen, with local people who will be trained into doing this. So the cleaning, we are now actually going into the cleaning of the environment. But one of my fe fears there as well is we are talking of cleaning over the next two or three months. We yet some of the toxic products will be in the environment and will be in the soil, in the air, well, the air, and also in the um, in the water cycle. Um, and those, of course, will stay there for, I believe, for quite a number of years to be uh, uh, further. Mm. And I can imagine, you know, just looking at a mangrove forest, how tough that must be to clean it. Huh? And then you've got the anaerobic environment. And I understand from some of the literature that. Yes. You know, once the oil gets deeper into the sediment there, that is very tough to get it out. Huh? Yes, uh, there have been, though I, I once happened is that when there was the shipwreck and especially when there was the oil spill, you had, uh, we had thousands of people, volunteers, who just came up and said, we're cleaning the oil. Mm. And, and Amazing. one of the fears is that they, uh, it's not, it's not badly intentioned, but one of the fears is that by having a lot of people bring the mangroves, they actually uh, drive in the, the, um, the oil into the mud, into mm. the silt, as you've mentioned, making it more difficult to clean. Mm. Right now, uh, the company that's come from Le Floc to do the depollution uh, is saying, we will tackle those areas, and these are the areas which are the, the most difficult to, to clean will be the, the mangrove areas, but it's got to be done uh, very carefully mm -hmm. in a planned manner. And one of the advice is if we need to do monitoring, if we need to do sample collection, if we need to do tagging of plants, uh, if we need to do cleaning, it's all done in one visit. Mm -hmm. Rather than having four or five multiple visits, is that it's one visit that aims to do all of that once. Uh, they are looking at different strategies to. Uh, to clean up those areas, including flushing. Uh, I'm also learning. I mean, this is all new to us. And yeah, we we're, we're here also learning, yeah, following yes. what's happening. Yeah. yeah, we're learning and we hear of a lot of things and um, we understand that nature also does its own job as well because there's a lot of microbes in the environment that will also uh, engulf the, the petrol. And uh, we we understand that one of the action, actions will be to flush the oil into the sea and when there are absorbent booms to catch this oil. Mm. Uh, that's one technique. Uh, but also another technique is we will not be able to remove all the oil from the mangroves and let nature do, it, do its job. Whether nature does its job completely or not is something that monitoring will confirm. Mm. And if you had to guess, which species are you most concerned about? Of course, Mauritius is an island. Um, 
you know, um, people associate the dodo with it. Yeah, and, you know, being an island, there's often a lot of endemic species, which only you have in Mauritius. Which of these species are you most concerned about at the moment? Well, uh, when we had the oil spill, the, the, the bird that was top on the list to evacuate from Ile uh, was the Mauritius olive white eye. Mm -hmm. which is a species which is endemic to Mauritius, declining on the mainland of Mauritius. But we have a, a, a population which we reintroduced on Ile Zigret. We had close to 70 individuals. Um, and this species is critically endangered and is most probably Mauritius's most threatened bird. So that was our first priority was to take a small number of birds off the island. So we've taken 12 of these birds off the island and we've uh, brought them into captivity. The idea is not to keep them in captivity forever, but once uh, the, uh, the conditions are right again, our hope within the next few weeks uh, is to bring those uh, individuals back and to release them on Ile Zigret again. These are wild birds. Uh, these are birds that uh, we are about to enter our breeding season for this species. So there are many reasons why we need to do it now and not wait too long. But we're just waiting to see that uh, staff can be based on the island looking after the birds uh, because we wouldn't want to be re-releasing really birds if our staff are not able to attend to birds if there's a problem uh, on a full-time basis. Uh, th that said, there are a number of islands which are just a few kilometers away from Ile Zigret. Uh, these are small islands of the bay. Uh, they are called Ile de la Passe, Ile Vacqua, Ile Fouquet, and Ile Marianne. And these islands have uh, populations of endemic reptiles. So there's the Bojo's skink, the Bouton skink, and the night gecko. Mm. The, the, all endemics, we have, huh? All endemics. Yeah. Uh, once we have these species on the northern islets, the research has shown that the genetic makeup of those animals on these small islands is different from the northern islets due to isolation. So we also unfortunately found that there was an important oil slick on two of these islands. So we have actually caught uh, skinks, the Bouton skinks, the Bourgeois skinks, and the, and the night gecko, which we are currently holding in a temporary facility. And because of, you know, we, we fear that there might be decline of the population uh, from these islands. Um, what we are now about to do is to send these reptiles to Jersey Zoo which is in the Channel Islands, British Channel Islands, so that the, those three uh, species would be safe there. Of course, we may return those animals later on. Uh, we may even breed them and return animals later on. But right now, it's a security that we are taking against decline or extinction of these three uh, reptiles from this, uh, this group of four islands. Excellent. So we don't lose them. So you're planning for yeah, a safety exactly. net there. Excellent. Exactly. And tell me, what does, uh, what does the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation need most at the moment? If you know, we had a dream world where everything was possible, what, what do you need? I guess you need more time, more staff. Tell us. All right. Staff is one because uh, we've had COVID lockdown here. Mm. We've had 10 people and we've been fairly good at managing COVID, uh, Mauritius. Uh, are you still had, in lockdown? Tell us. We are not in lockdown, but there are no commercial flights yet. There's talk of commercial flights in the next few months. Pressure from the tourism industry for tourists to come because we are, we are having severe... Tourism brings in lots of revenue for the island, which awesome. we badly need. So, however, the government is rightly being cautious about opening the borders because most of the countries that have opened their borders have had to lock down again. 
So there's talk of, of uh, opening the borders again, but whilst this happens, the staff and the volunteers that were meant to have come from abroad have not been able to come. Mm -hmm. So yes, we are in need of volunteers who can literally be available uh, the, the moment that uh, our borders open again. So we, we, need, we needed volunteers whilst there was COVID. We still need volunteers. And now with Wakasho, we, need, we desperately need the volunteers to come out. Uh, that's the what first thing. What skills should they have? They should be biological sciences. Somebody who's got a, a minimum BSc in ecology, biology, conservation, um, plant sciences. Also, we're looking for, for plant sciences. So basic uh, science undergraduate degree has been a minimum. Um, we have had Germans who have been volunteering for us for many years now uh, of very high standard. And of course, uh, anybody out there from Germany who's interested, please get in touch with us and with your CV and your references and uh, we'll be more than happy to consider. Um, but the other thing as well, traveling is getting, well, first of all, there's the restriction. Secondly, there is the quarantine, which people have to go into. And third is the cost of travel. Mm -hmm. So to volunteer now is becoming even harder for, for more expensive for, for people. We do offer accommodation and field transport. Uh, however, you know, the, the basic subsistence, uh, Mauritius is not overly expensive, uh, yet the flights are getting uh, more expensive, have got more expensive. Especially and more now, difficult. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with the German, with Germany, we used to have, I think, Lufthansa and Condor, and now I think there's none of that now happening. Mm. Um, but uh, so to come back to Wakashu, what yeah. we need. What else do you need? What does the Mauritian Wildlife Foundation need in addition to volunteers? Yeah. Now, when you ask any NGO, what do you need? The <laughs> first thing that they say is we need money. Okay, and I'll and I'll try to explain why we need money. On this island, we receive every year, this year we were planning on receiving 18,000 visitors. Mm. Quite a few of these visitors are from Germany, in fact. Uh, we have proportionately more Germans that visit us on Ida Zigret than any other foreign nations, <laughs> as a proportion. Um, now, with COVID lockdown, with the uh, closure of the borders, and now with Wakashu, Ecotourism, which was nearly 25% of our revenue, mm. has dropped down to zero, mm -hmm. near zero. We have uh, some Mauritians that come, but we don't make profit on the Mauritians that visit because we do it at a, at a fairly, uh, I would say, break-even price. It's awareness raising. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. It's important. So we do that. But so we do need tourists to come to Mauritius. So, you know, the southeast of Mauritius has been affected, but uh, the rest of Mauritius is still nice to visit. Uh, secondly, we need visitors to come and visit us. We will reopen tourism. As soon as the international borders are open, we will reopen for, for visitors. We are planning on opening for local visitors before then, of course. Um, probably in the next two weeks, we might open up for local vi visitorship. But we really need foreign visitors to visit us because this is how we make a lot of our uh, funding uh, uh, that, that comes. Uh, so that's important. And of course, um, restoration. Uh, we need to restore the island. The Wakashu has created more work for us. We suspect that we may, it may not be immediate, we may have a drop in the populations of plants and reptiles. Mm. I am fearing that we will lose vegetation on parts of the island. So we need to be growing more plants to plant back more plants. So we need money and uh, funding to be able to continue the programs. But I'm also looking at whether we need to do things like such as bioremediation in case we have accumulations of toxins in, the, in our environment on the Zigret. All of that we need funding. So yes, as an NGO, the first thing that I say is we need funding, but I wanted to qualify how we need funding. Yeah, we understand, you know, you're 
working so hard and doing such amazing work, you and your staff. Um, you've described some of this to us, um, but it's a huge yeah. job ahead, isn't it? Yeah. It is more work ahead. I mean, we've yeah. been working for 36 years and our fear is that we've made, made so many steps forward that with Wakasho, we've just made a few steps backwards mm. and that we'll have to catch up again. Mm. I've got one specific uh, marine question because I was looking at the, you know, you can track boats online through yeah. the AIS system and Mauritius is bang in the middle of a big international shipping lane from Malaysia right yes. uh, to Cape Horn in South Africa. Um, yes. And I was in a way surprised um, that um, I was surprised that large tankers and freighters uh, are allowed to go international waters um, despite, you know, Mauritius being such an ecologically important and sensitive area. Why is that? And why is there not a specific zone under the International Maritime Organization or the like to protect the amazing hotspot that you've got there? Well, you're, you're touching on, on, to, on something which has been of a great criticism to the government of Mauritius. Um, last month, we had 2,000 ships that passed by our waters, 2,000. And in the last five to 10 years, we've had as many as five shipwrecks on Mauritius. Mm -hmm. The commonality of these shipwrecks or, or vessel wrecks was that none of them were coming to Mauritius. Mm. They, yeah, they're just no passing, reason. right? Yeah. They were just passing. They were just passing. They were not even meant to be close to Mauritius. And they were not keeping to that 12, minimum 12 nautical miles distance. Uh, we have had wrecks uh, uh, very uh, recently, as I was saying. And I, we are hearing something which sounds uh, totally, uh, I'm, how can I say this, uh, is beyond belief that those ships are passing close to Mauritius so that they can catch our internet. Really? Yes. That's yes. incredible. So that's why they're passing close. Uh, <laughs> people are not believing it. Even I, we are hearing two sides of the story, but I've, I heard it uh, three weeks ago when, uh, when the Wakashu grounded. And first of all, I thought it was a joke, mm -hmm. but it's been coming up as something, uh, something which is not quite a joke. And, uh, and some of the specialists, telecommunications specialists have said it's impossible to do that. But there are also some people saying that's why those boats are passing close by Mauritius. So that I do not understand yet what is the technique, what is the technology that they're using, but apparently, and it's coming up in debates often, uh, whether it is an oaks or not, but uh, apparently this is what boats are doing. Somehow there's a system, there's a technique there that they are using so that they can catch our internet. Um, through the mobile possible. telephone network, presumably, huh? It could be through a mobile telephone network. And do they have a modem from Mauritius on the boat? Uh, the boat is still a few kilometers you know, passing still a few kilometers from Mauritius, or is the signal strong enough to catch that signal? I don't know, but it's coming up. Uh, you know, you have to ask yourself the question, why are those ships, so many ships, passing so close to Mauritius? And these include oil tankers, these include uh, freight, uh, freight ships, and these include fishing vessels. Uh, but the commonality is that when you look at the maritime maps of Mauritius in real time, it's almost that they're queuing. They're queuing behind each other. I was doing exactly that, and I was shocked to see so many um, international ships, you know, going into your waters despite not going to a Mauritian harbour. Is the, is the government planning to take action to the, protect the, there your waters is a, from this traffic? Uh, there is a lot of pressure for the relevant authorities to uh, clamp down. Um, we are told that these are, uh, there are international maritime organization rules uh, with our agreements that we've signed that we can uh, allow, we should allow um, 
there's a name that they call it, which is passage, free passage, or something of the sort. Um, and uh, friendly passage, I think it's called. Friendly passage in or our innocent waters. Innocent passage, yeah. Innocent passage. But uh, right now, there's a lot of pressure to actually put some order into it. Mm. And there's even been calls to say that IMO should help us uh, in trying to, uh, to, to put some order in this. Mm. Um, and I think that uh, we are going to talk about claims. I think if through the Wakashu, there is a severe penalty and a, and a, and a punitive uh, penalty to the Wakashu owners and the insurers, I think it, it should serve as a lesson to the other ship owners that are allowing their or condoning their ships from coming so close to Mauritius. Mm. And there's something under the IMO that's called a particularly sensitive sea area. So here, for example, in Germany, we've got the Wadden Sea, which is, you know, the largest uh, wetland of this nature globally, yeah. which is protected through that. Um, is that something that Mauritius is, is, is con considering to set up one of, one of these PSSAs under the IMO? It's, it's, it's interesting that you should mention this because last year, I think it was last year we had one of these. The, uh, the IMO came here, they are based in Britain, in England. The IMO came here and ran a workshop on particularly sensitive sea areas. Um, so we identified some, 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 uh, some areas. Mauritius has not as yet officially asked the IMO to designate particularly sensitive sea areas. And as per my recollection, I remember personally saying this two years ago to the IMO that we need to actually regulate the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the passage of uh, ships on the east of Mauritius. It hasn't been done to date. Mm. And I think, I think with what's happening, with, which, with, sorry, with what's happened with the Wakashu, I think now we have to go back to IMO and say, can we make, can we, put some order to that by declaring it particularly sensitive sea areas. We have had, uh, we have had wreck of a ship uh, called the Kayang, K-H-A-Y-A-N-G, mm -hmm. Kayang, uh, which um, I think was a Taiwanese vessel, a fishing, a fishing vessel that has wrecked on St. Brandon. And that's a place, and a lot of these places are charted on, on the maps. It's not as if they are not charted on, on, on mm -hmm. the bathymetric maps, they're there, but still people are not are coming so close. Now, I don't think St. Brandon as a remote group of islands has got enough internet for people to be catching the internet. So for me, I doubt internet was the reason why the, that ship was there. Uh, in the case of the current ship, I mean, the, there's an investigation going on and it appears that the captain um, was in a party. So they were partying, so despite so what, what we hear so far is, despite the Coast Guard calling them when they got, I think, to 12 nautical miles or something of the sort, um, calling and calling and calling, there was no response. Because apparently they were having a, a birthday party on the ship. And, and nobody when, was watching where they were heading? Uh, no, well, there was the Coast Guards watching where they were, where they were heading. This is all in uh, Parliament. It was revealed uh, no later than yesterday. And it's only when the ship wrecked, I think it's only when the ship wrecked that the captain realized it, it, it wrecked. And then he called, there was no Mayday uh, at all. They didn't respond to any of the calls which the Coast Guard were making out to the ship for several hours. Um, and they wrecked and it's then that the captain said, I've just wrecked. So presumably nobody on the bridge and they were on some autopilot or so on. No, no. That's and uh, and I mean there there are a lot of criticisms. People are angry in Mauritius, and people are asking for questions. People are asking for an, for a commission of inquiry into into the matter as well. Um, and I think uh, the country wants that. I think people are, are wanting it. They want to have answers, and they don't want to have uh, any of these happening again. Um, because there's there's also the human aspect of it. I mean people's livelihoods are affected. It's your fisheries, you know, you name it, you know, tourism, yeah. Yeah, your I mean, largest sources I, of income are affected, aren't they? 
Absolutely. I mean, the, the Southeast Island, the Southeast uh, Mayberg Island is an island that depends on fishing and on tourism. And there are some people who work in agriculture, but most people are depending on fisheries and on tourism. So this is, uh, the uh, Wakasho is actually going to affect lives of people for a few years to come. We ourselves, because as I mentioned, we run ecotourism on Ilo Zigret, we are going to be affected by it. Uh, and it just compounds the problems that we've been having uh, with Wakasho. It just, it's just compounded. Gosh, you've got a big job ahead. And I can, you know, share with you here, here in, in Germany and at Nabodez, there's big, you know, people here are also, you know, cross and just shaking their heads how this could be possible. And we really hope, yeah, that this won't happen again and that we can, yeah, assist you in putting in place, place measures to, to protect your waters and to hopefully quickly restore the amazing yeah. biological hotspot that you've got. Um, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us at this stage? I'm so, so grateful to you for taking this time with us to talk to us, sure. despite the many things on your desk. You're one of the busiest people on this planet <laughs> right now, I expect. <laughs> I'm quite busy I, I, to, to say the same. And um, uh, that is uh, not without having some impacts on the family, to be honest, uh, and, and, on, and on work because uh, basically all I'm doing right now is Wakashu and all the other work is just piling and piling and piling and piling. You know, we have lots of other projects um, and, and it's impacting the organization um, tremendously. Um, and I think one of the things which I wanted to say is I Mauritius badly needs tourism. We badly need to, tourists. And I think uh, there's a lot of communication. There's sensationalism also that's happening uh, out there. Um, and it is affecting the country economically as well and the reputation of the country. Um, I think these are, you know, we need to get over that. Um, and I think uh, as a bird life partnership has been great because um, We've had uh, several uh, organizations that have reached out to us, BirdLife Seychelles, uh, Nature Seychelles, uh, but also BirdLife South Africa. And uh, so there's been a lot of support from the BirdLife Africa Network in particular, uh, but also NABU. Um, LPO France uh, also has tried to assist uh, as well. Uh, so it, it's good to get all these, these connections. Um, I think one thing which we need to try to understand is the effect of such an oil wreck, uh, of, of a shipwreck and oil spill on, uh, on native biodiversity. Mm. This is the first for us. You know, we've never had this before. Uh, but probably South Africa, where they get uh, more frequent oil spills, uh, you know, could, could be able to help us. And they are, they've, they are, for example, facilitating SANCOM, which is an organization in South Africa, to come and help if there are old seabirds. I mean, we are predicting that we will be getting old seabirds over the next uh, weeks, months. Um, so we are looking for, and we need that help and we need that training as well. But, uh, but also a lot of people have been doing fundraising for us uh, in various different ways. Uh, and that, that is important for us to, uh, to, to continue because unfortunately the insurance money doesn't cover forecasted costs. Yeah. It will only cover expenses that you've had, that you've made so far. It's not going to cover, if you say in five years time, we may have a problem, they are gone well before then. So we will need to have funds that we can cope with any um, effects that could show up in a year, two years, three years time. Because there um, will be long-term impact. I mean, some of these oil spills have impacts beyond 20 years, right? Yes, exactly, exactly. But insurers don't would are not going to pay for something that's going to happen in 10, 20 years or even five years. The, the insurers would want to pay for what's happening now, what's happened, and then goodbye. Uh, so, so we we are having to to and, and of course it's not ju it doesn't just affect us. I mean, what's happened today to Mauritius could affect could happen to any IBAs. Uh, coastal IDAs around the world. It could happen in your Wadden Sea, I'm sure. 
Exactly. I know there's a lot of uh, uh, um, oil industries in the North Sea. So, you know, it could have affect uh, anyone. And, uh, but the one thing is, is uh, Mauritius and ourselves as an organization, the Mauritius as a country, we need to come out of this more resilient than we were. And that uh, it's been a, a steep learning curve for us. We've made mistakes. As a country, we've made mistakes. Um, as a country, we probably could have been more reactive or proactive, you could say. Uh, but I think we, uh, the, it's, a hard, it's a price that we are paying for lack of experience. But the next time, we will be more experienced uh, to be facing another disaster. Because I really do not think that this is the last shipwreck or the last oil spill that we're going to get. Yeah, looking uh, at that shipping water. vein, yeah, yes. it doesn't exactly. look like it. And you mentioned a really, really important issue which faces us here just like it, anywhere on the planet, which is crude oil, um, you know, the, the thick oil that we're seeing in your waters, yeah. which is still used to, to fuel um, ships. Um, throughout the planet and this switch to diesel and lighter fuels is so tough, but it's something that we really must work on as an international community. Yeah? Yes. When there's so many yeah. alternatives uh, and now that the, you know, fuel prices have dropped, it's, um, it's, it's a reality. I think it's really, you know, it's not a big cost for the shipping yeah. industry to switch from the, the heavy oil to, to lighter yes. oils like yeah. marine diesel. Yeah. Yeah, thank you so much. One last question. Do you, would you, would you uh, say that this is the worst ecological uh, catastrophe that Mauritius has ever faced? Definitely, definitely. We've never had anything of the sort. We, we, can, we are used mentally, if you wish, for having a new invasive alien species that reaches a place and a rat getting to an island and we need to deratize the island we are used to that. I mean, this is something that we understand uh, happens. We, we understand having to put quarantine and so on. It is an ecological disaster if rats get to an island. But we can deal with that because as a community, we are used to dealing with this. Even if we can't eradicate the invasion species, we know how to manage it, etc. For us in Mauritius, uh, we've never had, uh, had um, an oil spill. And we never thought, we would, I would never have imagined that at our doorstep, we would have had a shipwreck and least of all to have a, an oil spill with 1,000 tons of petroleum flowing past our island, which is only two kilometers away. I mean, it's, it's, it's a disbelief. It's disbelief, uh, you know, that, you know, I, I really can't, can't even imagine that it has happened. And it has been declared as an ecological disaster, even by the government. Under the Environment Protection Act, the country can declare uh, an environment state of emergency. Since the act came into force in the early 90s, it's never been, uh, it, it was, it's never been enforced, it's never been declared. This is the first time that this environment state of emergency has been declared. Uh, the southeast of Mauritius is affected. Whenever we've had some disaster of some sort, it has been extremely localized and contained. This one really went, uh, you know, went uncontrolled. Um, and, and the other thing is that we've been very lucky. We've been extremely lucky in this one. You could say, how could, you, how could I say this? I, 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 I can't wait to see to hear what you're saying because I'm going what could be worse you know well I'll tell you why the ship was almost empty it had 4,000 tons of, of uh, petrol and it was almost empty it was going through South Africa and it was going to Brazil uh, so it was almost empty when it uh, uh, hit us the second thing is that we didn't get an oil spill instant instantly the oil spill happened 12 days later. Had that ship been full of petroleum products and the, the oil spill happened instantly, we would have been looking at a, a disaster which is far more consequent than what we've seen. And the other thing is that when there was the oil spill, 
between the oil spill and the next 10 days, the weather was calm. The sea was calm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tugs managed to get close to the ship and the helicopters could work to pump the, to pump the, petrol, the petroleum out of the ships. Just imagine that after the 6th of August, when there was the oil spill, if the weather was as rough as it was before the oil spill, we wouldn't have been able to extract the oil from the ship. So those 10 days of very good weather and very calm seas allowed us to extract nearly 3,000 tons of petroleum products from the sea, uh, for, for, sorry, from the boat, but it also allowed the Coast Guard, Merchant Wildlife Foundation, uh, Special Mobile Force, which is our army, and thousands of volunteers, of ordinary citizens, to mop up the much of the 1,000 tons of petroleum, 800 to 1,000 tons of petroleum that was in the sea. So this is why we've been, uh, why we say that there have been a number of factors which have played in our favor, um, and those are the factors. Next time, we may not be that lucky. Which is why you need prevention and need to think about getting those big ships and tankers out of your waters to yes. protect the amazing biodiversity that you've got in Mauritius. Because I, I'd Pleasure. like to thank you so, so much for taking the time. Pleasure. It's really hugely appreciated. We'll do our best to support you through the BirdLife International Network here at NABU. Thank, thank you. you and please thank you, Nabu. Thank you to everybody. Pass thank you on to our regards to your team. Keep up the good work. We're with you in this. All right. Thank you. Danke.